record now. Cool. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming and taking some time out of your evenings to come and learn a little bit more about the topic that we're talking about today. Um, it's a really exciting evening. It's the first of our Kindling Farm webinar series um, titled Land Access and Food Sovereignty in the UK. Hopefully you'll all know that because you're here. Um, and it's also a really nice way to celebrate Earth Day. Um, for those of you who are aware, uh, who aren't aware, it's Earth Day today. Um, we all think that every day should be Earth Day, but there we go. Um, we only get one day a year to celebrate. Um, so yeah, we've got some really exciting, we've got some really amazing speakers tonight. Um, and the format of the talk will basically be me to kind of introducing um, the topic a little bit. Um, and then we will hear about 10 to 15 minutes from each speaker um, and you'll have a chance to ask any kind of clarifying questions after each speaker. So we'll just have one or two questions um, after each speaker just so you can kind of engage in what's happening and in what they're talking about. Um, and after each speak, after everyone's gone, um, that should take us up to about eight o'clock. And then the last half hour will be a kind of question and answer discussion space. Um, so I will be facilitating today. Um, you can ask your questions in the chat and I'll try and pick them up. Um, or you can wait till um, the when we do the Q&A session um, and put your hand up and I'll try and catch you. Um, just wanna, yeah, say, sorry if I don't get to your question. There's, um, there might be quite a lot of you by the time we kind of get through, um, get into the middle of this. So um, yeah, but we'll try and answer all of your questions. Um, and because we've got three speakers tonight, we, um, you, when you're asking a question you can either direct it straight to um, one of the speakers or you can just direct it to all of them and they will kind of choose between themselves who wants to answer first or um, yeah if they all want to answer that's also cool. So um, yeah tonight we are um, hearing from Tom from Shared Assets, um, Jyoti from Land Workers Alliance and Chris from our uh, own very own Kindling Farm. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm just going to give a really short introduction about um, or a bit of background to what we're talking about tonight. So the history of land enclosures goes back to about the 13th century when the commons began to be bought up and turned into small holdings. And since then, we've been a part of a long history of privatisation of land by England's ruling elite. So that's taking away land from the common good and thrusting most of the country's population into poverty by taking away their livelihoods and their homes. And today we're in a situation where half of England's land belongs to just 1% of the population, which is a pretty shocking fact. Um, but there are even more shocking facts when we look at the control of the food um, production system um, and the distribution system. So three companies control 50% of the global seed market, four companies control 75 to 90% of the global grain trade, five companies control 68% of the agrochemical market, 10 companies control over 40% of the global retail, retail market, and the list goes on. So it's pretty, um, yeah, pretty privatized and controlled by a very few um, huge corporations. And the argument that every citizen should have access to shelter, food and water, and a livelihood is a kind of obvious one. Um, it's literally written into the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Yet it is starkly contrasted to the way in which the majority of the global population live. And in this country alone, the average house price is at a record high of £256,000, um, while 1.9 million people rely on food banks and the unemployment rate has risen for the past three years to 4.9%, and that's 3.4 million people. So our understanding of what it means to have access to the essential goods necessary for a dignified life has become seriously warped by the centuries of conditioning into a system based on enclosure and privatisation. And rather than imagining access rights in terms of direct and guaranteed use of ne necessary resources themselves, so the land on which we grow food and on which we build homes, we instead think of access rights in terms of guaranteed provision of those necessities by state and corporate in institutions. And as well as leading to a critical breakdown between the vast majority of the population and the production of the resources upon which we rely, the hoarding and the misuse of these resources in the in pursuit of power and profit have resulted in a, an acute lack of reliable access for a huge number of people. So the imbalance is pretty bleak. 
and Brexit and COVID have only further exposed the country's vulnerability in, of the food supply chain, where 48% of the to country's total food consumed is, important, is imported. Um, and we've kind of seen the situation where COVID has shone a bright, a pretty bright spotlight on um, on the on those in our society who we now understand as essential workers. Where previously the discourse was um, kind of invisibilized people who worked in the food industry. And these decades of increasing imports, following on from the centuries of land enclosures in England, which have, which drove the population into cities has led to a, real, a really um, dire disconnect between us and what is on our plates. And it's created an even greater divide between ri the rich and the poor. And those who have the money continue to spend it on luxurious gastronomical delights, while the rest of the country are made to eat what they have access to. And that is most often highly processed, pesticide ridden, most often plastic wrapped, long life treated and nutritionless food flown from the other side of the world. So the notion of food as fuel is stronger than ever before and our tank is running on empty. And the lack of connection to the food production of food inevitably leads to a deterioration in the appreciation of its consumption. And there are mere 300,000 people and that's 0.004% of the population who actually own allotments with another 100,000 people on waiting lists while only one in eight homes have no garden in the UK. And for the majority of the people, of people living in the UK, it's nearly impossible to grow our own food or to have access to any land on which to earn a living. So what do we do about it? Um, I'm gonna hand over now, I'm gonna stop talking um, to Tom to talk about some solutions. Nice, thank you very much, Lizzie. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick screen share. Um, so hopefully that'll take a second, but um, just whilst I'm uh figuring out how that works um i just want to say thank you to lizzie and chris and helen um for inviting me to talk today um uh, it's a real privilege to be alongside you guys and alongside jyoti as well um so yeah so i'm just having a little trouble finding where my uh this presentation is on my screen just give me two seconds here we go Almost there, guys. Thanks for the patience. Right. Can everybody see that? All right. Quick show of hands. Amazing. Incredible. So, um, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Um, my name is Tom. I'm part of the um, shared assets team. Um, I've just got a few things I'm going to sort of talk about today. I was going to share a little bit about shared assets and who we are and what we do. Um, um, I was also just going to add a little bit of flavour to um, uh, Lizzie's sort of uh, introduction to some of the sort of food system problems. And then I was also going to talk a little bit about some of the sort of exciting solutions that um, shared assets has sort of worked with and become aware of around our, our work in the, in the land system, particularly around sort of some cool approaches around uh, I guess what we're calling community land banking um, in the first instance, but that might um, evolve as a term over time. So I trust that's all right uh, with everybody. So um, yeah, shared assets, just briefly. Um, shared assets, we call ourselves a, a think and do tank. Um, and we um, what we really do is we work often with um, uh, landowners and land stewards to support them to um, steward land for, for the common good and for the better. Um, there's lots of different um, aspects to um, shared assets work. Um, and um, the bit I look after is the consultancy part. Um, so that's the do bit of that think and do tank. Um, uh, I'm not so much a greater thinker though. And so there are some other people in the organization who do the thinking largely on my behalf. And that's our research bit where we um, you know, do lots of research into um, some of the land issue and land uh, system questions that we um, have as well. Um, um, I also just want to sort of share a little bit about this. Um, we, we, a lot of the groups that we work with, we work with um, community led organizations, we work with um, local authorities, and we um, also work with sort of private developers um, on lots of different land based issues. They all have though one sort of 
lots of things in common. You can see them up here. So they're often associated with um, creating livelihoods from the land. Um, the, the impact the work has um, often improves the environment. There's often a sort of productive nature to the work. So, um, you know, things are produced um, with the land. So that might be food if it's a food growing project. It might be um, charcoal if it's a woodland social enterprise, or it might be, you know, um, uh, bring to people together in a in a in a cafe or in a park if it's um, in a park place placed uh, base of place of work. Um, uh, the other bits around here around shared benefits. So you know um, uh, we use this phrase common good land use because we believe that you know with land we can create um, opportunities for people to solve a wide range of you know, economic, social, and environmental issues. Um, is something that we'll we'll hear a lot about today. I think from Chris in particular is around sort of community control and community um, connection um, to do with uh, the projects that we work on. And uh, I'm going to give you a warning on this as well because I'm going to do a little bit of systems talk as well. But um, a lot of the work that we do is around sort of systems change. So um, there'll be um, three sort of systems things that um, I chat about as well. I'll try and make them as digestible as possible. I promise. But they they can look sort of alarming in the first instance. Um, I suppose the other thing just to say is, you know, why we do this as well. Um, you know, I've mentioned that, um, you know, that we, we think that the land system needs reforming and, you know, fundamentally believe, we believe that with land we can change, uh, challenge, we can create, with land we can flourish and with land we can connect. So hopefully that gives a sort of brief flavour to shared assets. Um, I didn't want this to be a sort of shared assets sort of, you know, sales pitch or anything. So uh, what I really want to talk about is just um, uh, a few of the things that, um, uh, well, you know, a few of the things that Lizzie's brought up. This is um, uh, one of my, well, this is a slide from a, a book called uh, Food Wars by a, a guy called Tim Lang. I'm sure many people may have come across him before. This book was uh, written in 2004. And uh, what I really like about this is the, um, the you know, how it sort of showcases 2004 graphic design um, because uh, boy, is that some some blocky stuff. But um, uh, apart from you know those sort of graphic design principles, what I think is really nice about this is it shows a bit of a story of the, uh, I guess the influences on the food system today. So you know, looking back to the 1800s, you had lots of sort of inputs to the food system: the um, agricultural revolution, the chemical revolution, and the industrialization of the food system. And that's led to a state of where we are today, really, which is in this you know productionist paradigm. You know, a lot of the the I guess food and farming ventures that you come across are very much around you know producing more and more food to feed more and more people. Um, and as Lizzie touched on, that's you know increasingly unhealthy on all sorts of fronts. Um, what Tim then goes on to say in this book is. Um, uh, you know, that's led to a state where there's lots of food wars going on. So there's battles between different stakeholder groups and that can be between, you know, organic farmers versus conventional farmers versus, you know, health professionals versus um, doctors versus everybody else. And um, actually there's a whole sort of 200 page book on this, which if you want to read about it, you can, but um, it's very um, academic. So, um, you know, treat that with a pinch of salt. Um, the final thing he goes on to say uh, is that, you know, once these battles are over, there's likely to be one of two paradigms. You know, there's a lot of academic stuff in this, but um, uh, one of them he calls the life sciences integrated paradigm, which is about, you know, food ventures using uh, tech to do good things. And the other one is the, does it say, the ecologically integrated paradigm, which is about sort of working with nature and food systems as well. But um, I just thought that was a sort of nice way of sort of introducing a, um, that sort of timeline of food systems today. Um, the other thing that I quite like from this book is um, uh, this table here, um, which um, I think goes some way to sort of show some you know, the growing disconnection that people often have with food. Um, just to explain it briefly again, there's, you know, obviously the left axis shows time, the, the, the top axis here shows, um, I guess, the, the closeness of that particular actor to the food system. Um, so, you know, going from farmers through to wholesalers, retailers, and eventually finishing with um, sort of marketing. What I've done here is sort of highlighted um, the, the word dominant. So this table showing, you know, who the dominant actor is at each stage through time. And you can see that, um, you know, as we're going through time, we're moving further and further away from um, sort of a connection with uh, food and food systems. Um, 
well, you know, I mentioned the book was written in 2004. Um, this um, sort of timeline sort of finishes in 2010. And what I kind of like is the, the slight um, sort of, uh, I know, possibly correct prediction Tim made around how comms and marketing has sort of become dominant in the food system. Um, quick anecdote here is that, um, you know, my partner and I, we, we, we're now obviously frequent YouTube watchers and we're now getting constantly bombarded with like HelloFresh, um, uh, you know, veg box adverts. So I think it knows that at least I, you know, do a lot of reading around food, but I'm sure everybody else has sort of experienced, um, you know, how, how comms and marketing has become at least a dominant part of um, uh, how we interact with food. Um, not necessarily saying all of that is bad, but it has led to a sort of disconnection from um, food and so and I'm sure all of us have experienced you know um, we're not even go often we're not even going to the supermarket anymore to um, buy our food we're, we're having it delivered directly to us anyway um, I don't want to dwell too much on sort of problems and issues I did also want to talk about um, some solutions to this as well and uh, I mentioned earlier that um, we've been doing some thinking and looking into um, different approaches that we're broadly calling community land banks. And what I want to share with you now is about two or three different examples of um, how certain communities have come together to resolve issues around housing, farmies and farming and even uh, entire cities. Uh, before I get into this, I did warn you that there was going to be another sort of systems thing on this, but um, uh, this is a diagram that um, I often use. Um, my, my partner calls it the ecological squiggle, but um, uh, uh, she hates me. She hates it when I, when I explain this to people. But um, uh, the idea of this is um, that um, this shows how different systems can adapt and evolve through time. Um, and um, it's actually taken from um, ecological um, systems thinking. You can almost think about it like a butterfly population that, you know, butterflies populations, they can rise, they can fall, they can um, change and adapt. But that rising and falling is OK as long as they're still there. And that shows that they're resilient. And I think that's quite nice. And I think it gives some confidence that, um, uh, you know, uh, systems can sort of change and get in a mess sometimes, but still resolves themselves. What some very sort of smart and clever people did is took that system, took that thinking around um, butterfly populations and applied it to social systems. And what this diagram attempts to show is that, um, uh, you know, the, the different assets that um, appear in any system. So in a food and farming system, that might be machinery, it might be land, it might be people. Um, you know, those, those assets can sort of um, uh, be, um, I guess, gathered and um, used in lots of different ways to still get a same a nice result. So hopefully that's sort of fairly clear on that. But um, just bear in mind that sort of that, that idea as I'm, as I'm chatting it, that, you know, uh, things can rise and fall and we can um, make use of assets that are uh, coming from collapsing systems and into new and emerging ones. Um, uh, the other thing I just uh, wanted to move on to then was just around sort of um, community land banks. We um, have got a sort of fairly broad definition of community land banks. Um, um, what we sort of mean by it really is like an organisational collective that um, acquires land and uses or distributes it or stewards it for a very specific purpose or use. The other thing just to bear in mind is, um, you know, around that word community and community can often be interpreted as a community of place. So you might think about your local community, but um, what we also mean by here is all these other different types of communities. So a community of interest, um, a community of practice, so that could be a community you know, farming or food and farming community. Um, or it could, it could be a community of identity. So, um, you know, LGBTQ plus um, identity or anything like that as well. So there's de several different communities we're dealing with here. Um, cool. Um, hopefully I'm doing all right for time, Lizzie. Is that, we're doing good? Thanks. Um, so um, I want to get onto these sort of cool, sexy, juicy uh, examples of people doing good stuff resolved around an issue. Um, the first one is just around um, Coin Street, um, which... Um, People may be familiar with what Coin Street um, was or is as a community land trust, um, and it has a quite interesting story. Um, it's based on the South Bank in London, and um, during the sort of 1960s, there was um, a sort of regeneration period happening there. Um, there's also there was also a huge decline in the residential population, so the population 
the residential population fell from around 50,000 to just under 5,000 in, in the course of a decade. Um, and that meant that lots of the people living there were beginning to feel very marginalized um, and disconnected from you know, their sense of place. Um, However, the residents came together and you can see on the pictures here, there was a big campaign um, and they created a sort of community plan which prioritized three things, you know, people, homes and community facilities. What this led to over time was essentially the, the, the grouping there, the Coin Street Community Builders as it became um, being sold um, a 13 acre, I think it is 13 acre um, piece of land that they then converted into um, a fantastic um, community land trust with all sorts of community facilities. This happened in 1984. Um, and so they got sold the land at, at a million pounds, um, which was quite a lot of money then, but um, was apparently a quarter of the, of the market value. Um, and that sort of um, uh, that sort of principle of uh, sort of um, taking land out of the market in perpetuity has, re has remained with them ever since. Um, if you ever get the chance to go to Coin Street, its facilities are absolutely fantastic. And, um, uh, you know, not that I've ever lived there, but they also have sort of shared community facilities and stuff as well. So I'd highly recommend going there. Um, the nice thing in particular about Coin Street is that um, it's obviously inspired lots of other community land trusts. It, um, uh, in no way was it necessarily the first community land trust that never occurred, but um, it was such a sort of pioneering example that you know, have community land trusts popping up all over the country and lots of different um, interest groups and community groups um, uh, trying to solve their own housing issues, which is very exciting. Um, second one uh, I want to talk about is um, Ted Lien in France. Um, uh, Helen and Chris, I think we we uh, met on a sort of Ted Lien trip, which is quite exciting. Um, but um, just to um, explain what they are, th this is obviously based overseas in France and um, they are um, a food and farming organization that uses an investment model to acquire and purchase land and then either uh, convert or retain um, organic farmland for organic farm use. Um, they were set up about 15, 20 years ago, um, but have used an investment model quite similar to um, the ones that um, Helen and Chris are using. Um, and um, if people are familiar with Ecological Land Co-op as well, it's a sort of similar model to that as well. Um, the great thing about Terre de Lien is that um, they have gone into some sort of mega finance areas as well. So they've got about 3,000 investors all across France, roughly 80 million euros of investment. And uh, I think the, uh, the stats change all the time, but last I heard they've, they've um, acquired and uh, look after around 3,000 hectares of French farmland, all of which is um, used for organic farming. Um, the sort of issue here that they were trying to res resolve was one of a particularly deep connection, particularly in France, um, you know, sort of, um, what do you call it, a sort of cultural connection between food and the fear that lots of French farmland use might be turned into, um, you know, you know, uh, more conventionally farmed land. Um, and yeah, absolutely excellent project, someone that I'm really pleased to have worked with. Um, bring things a little bit closer to home. This is an unknown piece of work that happened in the UK. Um, it was called the, the Land Settlement Association. Um, in the 1930s, um, there was, uh, it was obviously the time of the Great Depression and there was lots of unemployed people. Um, this was actually government backed, would you believe it? So this is a scheme where national government um, uh, asked underemployed and unemployed industrial workers to come and basically grow food growing produce um, on estates. Um, if you ever get the chance, do Google this afterwards, but there are some fantastic 1930s recruitment videos um, of this lying around on YouTube, which are um, very of their time. But um, the, the, the broad concept was that you as an individual could um, were, were um, asked onto an estate with around 50 other people, 50 other families. You were given um, five acres of land each um, you're giving housing and accommodation and all that sort of stuff. And you were tasked with on this estate growing um, uh, horticultural produce. And uh, in its time, the, the, the LSA ran from 1930 something to 1984, I think it was. And um, uh, there were 16 of these estates, I think, um, all across the country. The, the sort of bare bones of its infrastructure um, still exist today. 
Um, but what I really like about this this uh, sort of project and this this work that happened was that again it was around people resolving an issue that they had at the time, which was one of um, you know unemployment and uh, particularly you know healthy food production as well. Um, the final example I've got here is um, taking that sort of concept to to a much much bigger scale, which is Letchworth Garden City. Um, I, I grew up in St Albans, um, and Letchworth is only I don't know 10 15 miles north of that so this is a place that's fairly familiar with to me but um you may know this but in uh but Letchworth Garden City essentially was in its early days um an, a a community benefit society a form of cooperative and um the way it um raised the finance was essentially through a community share issue um the um the sort of beginnings of this work began with um Ebenezer Howard who um uh, wanted, there's, there's a picture up here of three magnets. I don't know if you can see it very well, but the sort of idea was that um, he wanted to build cities that would bring together the best aspects of town, the best aspects of country, um, and uh, give people the healthiest living conditions that they could they could possibly live in. Um, and uh, yeah, they they sort of uh, financed and uh, their work through a community share issue. They built Letchworth Garden City. Um, Letchworth Garden City was actually the um, uh, was actually the one of seven cities he had planned. The, the, the sort of second greener diagram here was um, uh, that it was one of the small cities he wanted to create a sort of huge network ring of um, different uh, I don't know food uh, sorry different uh, living environments and cities around uh, around the country. And he, he almost did it with a uh, Welling Garden City, which for some reason is seems to be more famously known than Letchworth, the first one, but. Um, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the great thing here is, you know, again, um, somebody re responding to um, uh, an issue of seeing, you know, squalor in towns, um, uh, seeing, um, you know, disconnection in the countryside and wanting to, um, you know, create a solution through, um, through, you know, basically taking on land and building housing on it to resolve that issue. So it's really nice. Um, I did say that that was my last example, but um, I just want to briefly say that I think and hopefully the, the next great example of community land banking will be and is going to be actually the Kindling Farm. Um, and so I'm really pleased that um, uh, yeah, Helen, Chris, Lizzie and the rest of the Kindling team are, uh, you know, becoming pioneers in resolving, um, you know, Manchester's uh, and the greater Manchester area's food system issues. Um, so um, yeah, I think I'll wrap it up there, but um, yeah, thanks. There's my details are here. Um, I'll stop sharing the screen and maybe I can take a few sort of clarification and um, uh, clarification questions. Thank you so much, Tom, so interesting. Um, yeah, does anybody have any quick questions, one or two? There will also be a space to ask, ask questions at the end. Doesn't look like it. Cool. Okay. Um, let's go on to the next speaker then. Um, Jyoti, do you want to kick off? Hi, everybody. No questions. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> anyway, um, my name's Jyoti. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I'm a farmer based in Dorset and I work for the Land Workers Alliance. Um, which is a union for farmers, foresters, and land-based workers um, based in the UK. And um, yeah, um, we uh, basically, uh, as a union, represent our membership who are, you know, trying to, and a lot of them are new entrants that are trying to get into farming and people who have gotten through and gotten some land and are trying to maintain a viable enterprise, um, doing organic farming, agroecological farming, small scale farming, community based farming, that kind of thing, um, and manage the land in harmony with the environment. Um, and um, basically, yeah, a, a, a lot of my work with the Land Workers Alliance is rooted in my my own story um, of trying to get onto the land. And I suppose instead of loads of stats, that's where my experience with land has come from in that, um, I, yeah, I, I wanted to try and farm. Um, I didn't have land in this country. Um, and me and my husband wanted to raise our kids on the land. We wanted to have something, um, some sense of autonomy. We wanted a job that meant something to ourselves. Um, and we also, you know, found it very difficult to find employment at that time in, in the 90s. And, and 
yeah, wanted to be able to provide our own shelter um, because we, we didn't have a place to live. Um, yeah, and we're um, very, very low income. And, um, you know, it, it, rent can be such a huge thing for a young family to face. Um, and, you know, I wanted to raise my kids so that they were with me when I was working. So we were really thinking about, well, how, how do we get land? How do we access land? Because if you've got land, you have so many of those resources that you can provide for your own livelihood. You can get your own income security. Um, um, you know, if you get a few solar panels, you can provide your electricity, um, you know, you can provide shelter for yourself in a very low impact, environmentally friendly way um, and quite a lot of your own food, you know, and it provides, a, a, you know, some basic bits of autonomy. And it's true for um, people all over the world. If you're connected to the land um, in some way that being connected to your ecosystem and all the resources there by stewarding them, by looking after them, you can also be providing so much of your own needs in your life um, to, to provide a life that isn't so dependent on having to buy things all the time, you know, on the whole consumer economy. And that's kind of what we wanted. Um, and we looked around for quite a long time trying to find lands in the UK. And the UK is a really difficult scenario if you, you know, want to learn how to farm, um, uh, we, you know, without a lot of income to be able to go to an agricultural college or expensive training courses. So we went around volunteering places to try and pick up skills. Um, and you soon realize that land in, in the UK, because it's a very small um, set of islands um, and it is quite competitive and it's really locked up in the aristocracy owning lots of land very wealthy people owning a lot of land um, and there's a huge competition for it so it's quite expensive and you know if you're trying to get a look in on getting a piece of land it's it, it's a really hard thing to do and you know we visited so many different projects and communities um, and places to be able to do that um, and um, you know experiencing that journey of trying to get land I mean we eventually um, you know we lived for a little while in a little squatted piece of woodland that um, it was just available and then we moved to a community farm that had been bought by a group of people and set up as a trust and lived there for a little while and then we moved on a few families from there to take out a loan from a bank to be able to um, buy our own farm um, and be able to set up you know our, our own house there and um, we built that because uh, we were able to afford to be able to get it because we didn't have planning permission. Um, and, and so we built a house and then there's this whole structure in the UK where if you haven't got planning permission to build a dwelling on your land and if you need a dwelling in order to run your business, it's very difficult to do. And that can be a really stressful process for a lot of people. Um, uh, so we had to you know, go to pl uh, planning court to be able to try and prove the need to live on our land, etc. cetera. And um, you know, we won that case, but it was, it was quite stressful. Um, and eventually now 17 years later, we were able to you know, um, have a viable business on our farm and share that with so many other people around us. Um, but you know, that, those problems are really fundamental if you're getting into land. And that was part of the reason um, you know, I, I got involved with the Land Workers Alliance. And now I do a lot of work on a governmental level to think, you know, if we're gonna get more people onto the land, if we're gonna help people connect with nature a bit more in their livelihood or become a bit more autonomous or find a way to provide for our food supply, which is fundamental to society, then we've got to think about those wider structures that govern our land. Because actually people wanting to step forward and produce our and food is our food sovereignty, you know, and, and food sovereignty, what that concept is, and our organization is a part of an, um, a larger global organization called La Via Campesina, um, which is, you know, working with, you know, 200 million um, peasant farmers and indigenous people around the world who, you know, land is, is core to, to their, their entire livelihood, you know, for their shelter, for, for their means of, you know, um, uh, feeding themselves, um, for their fuel wood, you know, for, for their cultural identity, all, all of that, you know, and, and if we're going to connect people in this country to be able to do that, then we've really got to look at those wider structures that govern land, what it means to us as a society, and really think about creating some sort of overarching governance structure for land and ways that we as a society can actually regain control of, of land and, and the planning for that land overall. So with the Land Workers Alliance, um, that's something that 
um, you know, our, our organization looks at quite closely. And now I'm, you know, I've, I've moved from, you know, yeah, starting our farm and working there to becoming um, our campaigns coordinator. So I work a lot on, you know, looking at the wider political picture. But another project we've been working on is looking at land use and the overall land use picture for the UK. So I'm just going to talk about that a little bit because I think it, it um, has helped me formulate what I think we need to start doing in order to be able to provide for our own food sovereignty. Um, my daughter, who ra I raised on the farm here now and is now 24 years old. Um, so, you know, she, she, she grew up with me on the farm, you know, working on the farm all the time. And, um, you know, we, did, we didn't, have, didn't have much electricity, so didn't watch much TV, but we talked about these things all the time. Anyway, she went on, um, graduated from Oxford now and is incredibly good at um, land use modeling. So what we did is we tried to look at can Britain feed itself, but at the same time, can we mitigate the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis that we're facing? And, and how does all of those uses of land, because land is there for so many things, it's there to produce our food, it's there to provide a beautiful landscape, you know, visually for us to live in, it's got a, a cultural community identity, but it's also fundamental to how we solve the climate crisis and how we restore nature because it's there for all of nature and all the creatures and everything um, that depend on it as well as us and um, you know all those competing uses have to fit together and um, if we're going to provide for our own food sovereignty that means providing for quite a lot more of the food than we produce today you know what Lizzie was talking about earlier we're only producing about 48 percent of our our food that we consume here in, in, in UK and, um, you know, we'd like to see the amount of that food that we produce for ourselves in the UK and it's distributed out the UK to go to a much higher level. Because if we, you know, if we think about our global responsibility and we think about the whole world and all the agricultural land out there as a commons, we actually don't want to be importing loads of food from other places when people should be able to feed themselves. You know, the good resources in every country should be there you know, for, for the people within that country to feed themselves and their own communities rather than providing loads of food for, for us. It's our basic global responsibility to actually not be a colonial empire extracting the good resources of everywhere else to feed ourselves. So, you know, that's a, it's a very important principle um, to think about, you know, maximizing the food security, can we feed ourselves here? Um, but also, how much land do we need to dedicate to planting loads of trees so that we can sequester all the carbon so we can reach net zero? How much land do we need to set aside for, for wildlife corridors so, you know, all the insects can come back? You know, we've lost what, almost, you know, 60% of insects, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Well, you know, all the birds, all the, all the wildlife that needs to be there, they need space too. Plus we need all the housing, people need somewhere to live. How do we combine all these multiple uses for land on such a small land area? Um, and we, we tried to work out the figures um, to see what, how we could fit this all together. So there's, there's um, about 24 million hectares of land is the total UK land area that's there. And in terms of agricultural land, um, there's about 18 million hectares that's available for or, or being used for agriculture, right? And so we were trying to think about that and how much could be produced on that land if we tried to produce it all agroecologically and looked at our current diets for how much everybody eats, you know, how much meat and how much arable and how much, um, you know, that's wheat and peas and things like that. Um, how many vegetables, you know, all those things do we consume as a society and how much land does that take if that was all gonna be produced organically um, and then, you know, think thinking about um, yeah, basically how much you know how much of that we want to be able to produce here and how much we want to import, and seeing whether we can balance that all out, and and figure out if we can also have enough land left over from producing that food to produce plant all the trees that we need and restore all the nature to where it needs to be. Right, that's a lot to fit in on twenty four million hectares of land. Um, and so the population is projected by 2050 of the UK to reach 79 million people. Um, and, you know, looking at the current diets, in order to, to feed everybody, we'd need far more, far more, far more land than is available in the UK for 79 million people. Especially if it's organic, because organic farming takes usually 20% more land 
than, than intensive farming does. And if, if you have animals being reared outside, um, you know, then they take up lots more space as well because they're not all cramped into little factory farms, even if you think about all the grain that's used for them, et cetera. So we tried to figure out, well, how does this all fit in? And um, we we're trying to figure out what the best land use scenario was to try and get it all to fit in. And, um, you know, we've jig we jigged it around quite a lot, thinking about all the different scenarios that might go on. And we realized if we're going to get feed 79 million people and be able to produce 80% of our own food here in the UK, which still leaves us room to import things like bananas and oranges and rice and some of those things that people really, you know, want to consume and they could be imported fairly through a fair trade kind of mechanism. We wanted to get to 80% production organically here to feed 79 million people, we'd need to eat about half as much meat um, as we do um, because meat takes up a lot of land. We'd have to reduce our sugar intake, but we could have huge amounts of vegetables growing. <laughs> and um, it was a really interesting sort of thing to look at that because it started to think about, well, you know, and then we'd need to plant loads more land to trees. Um, and we'd also need to sort of really think about the distribution of those fruit and veg and where is that's all distributed from and really start to think about having the zone that's around cities actually feeding the people in the city so that, you know, the distribution miles, if, you, if all of this is to achieve net zero at the same time, we've really got to think about where it's coming from and where it's transported to in order to feed everybody. And it's all possible. Basically what we worked at, this is all possible with a slight change in diet and a big change in land use. And, and we could have many, many more jobs on the land. We can employ so many more people actually producing that food through more um, labor intensive agroecological farming. Um, and we'd have a lot more jobs because we're producing a wide, a bigger percentage of our food supply. We worked out you'd need 160,000 new farms to be able to be able to get up to that level of self-sufficiency, which means a lot of new farmers who, of course, all need access to land in order to be able to do this. And particularly a key part of that is that it should be on the edges of cities, that the area around cities should be providing a huge amount of that fresh, fresh dairy and fresh fruit uh, and fresh you know, vegetable supply to the cities in order to, you know, bring down those food miles to the level we needed to try and reach net zero. So, you know, that's all part of that big picture. And the reason I kind of went into detail about this is because it shows how, you know, and, and we can model it in all different ways. I don't want to talk about, you know, what those conclusions were because you can change those variables, you know, all over the place and everything. But it's the idea that we need a big picture for land use. We need it to be something that is where we think about all the complex interrelationships of the usage of land. We think about the needs of society going first. The fact that everybody needs to be fed in a respectful way with, you know, employment and jobs and the way that landscape is managed. We've got to deal with the climate crisis. We've got to deal with the nature crisis as a commons, as a society, as a community. And that big picture of land use has to be taken on board in our decisions about land use um, and how incredibly important it is to get those jobs on the land and, and how that all fits into it. And really, this country has not had an adequate land use planning system for a very long time. We've got the Town and Country Planning Act, which looks at where housing goes, and it's there to protect and keep the countryside quite beautiful in terms of stopping unsprawled development. But does it look at land use? No, it doesn't adequately look at land use. And there's, you know, there's things that where there's a grading system, grade one and two land and some agricultural ties and that kind of thing, but it's still not quite there with really taking on board you know, that precious resource of land that we've got that needs to be generating our food supply as well as regenerating our ecosystem and mitigating the climate crisis and, and realizing that that's got to be regulated and it's got to be regulated for the common good and owned by, by society as a commons to make those decisions on that land. Um, you know, so yeah, basically what needs to be done is we need a land use plan where government actually seriously researches this and thinks about you know what like a national land use plan should look like there needs to be input from the whole community you know serious input by society as to what we want from that land use you know uh, you know the food sovereignty that we want the housing that we need you know that the, the, the looking after nature that we need and that's got to be handled in a very inclusive way so it's not just the richest or the most powerful in society that are feeding into that plan, but 
everybody that had, you know, some some something that needs to be sorted out, you know, in relation to land, having an input into what happens with land. And then that needs to go into our planning system. Um, and, and, you know, of course, you know, when that happens, when we've got a land use plan and we've got a planning system that actually recognizes how important the interrelationship between land and food is, then at the forefront of it and, and, and recognized as the heroes of this society will the people be the people going into forestry, farming, land use, and building sustainable, eco-friendly housing. You know, those, those people will be the real heroes of this because they'll be bringing forward this land use pattern that can actually solve all these things that can feed us, that can mitigate the climate and nature crisis that we're facing. And, th and that will put, you know, um, new entrants to farming in, in a really good position. And, and, you know, there's a lot more society should be doing to, to recognize the needs to new entrants to farming, forestry and land use, uh, sustainable land use, because, you know, I, I, I can't leave out foresters because they're just as important because in that land use plan, of course, you know, there's a lot more land de de dedicated to woodland, which needs to be managed, which needs to be producing our timber for our housing and all those kinds of things. If we have fewer, fewer people producing animal products, then we want more jobs and we want more people doing sustainable land management as well. And so all of that, that is really a part of it. And that, you know, there used to be a system called county farms that were farms that are owned by the government, um, which are leased out to people to be able to farm them, but they're owned in perpetuity by local councils for, for people to use. Um, and they're being sold off. They're being asset stripped as local governments keep um, losing funds because they have, you know, their, their front, you know, their, their budgets are being cut all the time and they need to, you know, put their money towards frontline services, then they sell off their county farms. And that's really, you know, it's, it's a really critical thing because if we start losing that vision that government should actually be owning land for the common good, um, that means we're starting to go further and further and further down this trap where everything is privatized, you know, land is a commodity, farms are, are, are a commodity, you know, only for, for private ownership. Um, and there's other models like the land trusts that um, were mentioned earlier, like the ecological land trust, you know, where there's land that's bought by, um, you know, buy a trust and, and can be, you know, they get the planning permission all sorted out and, you know, and then smallholders can move on there and run viable farm businesses on very long, um, long-term leases. Um, in a sense, those are owned by private trusts, but actually I feel like the government should be investing in those things. If we're serious about our food security, we're serious about our land management being held for the common good, then that actually should be something that's owned on a wider level and then of course what's going on with kindling farm you know that is that is the ultimate sort of solution you know that communities should be maintaining ownership of their land to be producing the food for for the local area and and you know all of these solutions we need to start rolling them out more and they should really be getting that backing in legislation um and the planning laws backing that up so that people can also get housing in, in association with you know that 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 kind of stuff. You know, we should have a lot more housing projects that have big, you know, big gardens and small holdings attached to them, so people can be producing their own food, but having that autonomy in terms of housing at the same time, um, all all of that. And the third thing I th I think that government should be doing to to help fulfill this big picture and taking land use seriously is is thinking about diversity and inclusion because right now you know the way land is so locked up with very large landowners the aristocracy with um you know um large investment companies um billionaires literally being able to buy land um it makes it very difficult for people from um, socioeconomic circumstances where they haven't inherited land, they don't have a lot of money to invest, they aren't able to take out loans to be able to get into um, food farming and, and land-based work. Um, and, you know, if, if we're, you know, if one of the goals of this is also to be creating jobs, then we need to be making sure that that access to land does go across society. Also, you know, land work is one of the least um, racially um, inclusive um, jobs that there is. Uh, almost all the farmers um, you meet um, in the UK are white. Um, a lot of the farm managers are, are, are male. Um, and you know you don't you don't nearly get the amount of um, inclusion and diversity that we should. And that, that's something that government needs to take seriously and be proactive about. 
um, addressing and whether that's through training and scholarships and you know improve access for um, community buyouts from um, you know BIPOC communities and communities in socioeconomically deprived areas to be able to get access to land to be able to provide jobs within their own communities um, and also you know uh, and some food security as well you know that all of that needs to be taken as a priority to, to reverse the situation um, and to be honest really we could get more radical than that where you actually start compulsory purchasing or taking back land that was given to aristocracy you know, uh, at, you know in in you know the 1600s and things like that you know a lot of land was given to people like right now at the moment my farm just below me there's um a big bit of land um that was was um, being leased by a big industrial dairy um, 260 acres of land that dairy farm has gone bust and I was looking into it to try and figure out who who owns that land you know that's behind me it's owned by Lord Hood of Loaders who nobody's ever met around here um, and we looked him up and um, you know in the 1600s um, you know one of his ancestors won a naval battle and was given all this land um, for winning the naval battle and still continues to own that land and, and share farms it with whoever is actually the tenant farmer not giving the tenancy unless it's share farm so they can keep getting inheritance tax relief and has owned that since the 1600s nobody in the community even knows that you know and and everybody actually wants a stake in what's happening with that land because it's just above the water catchment for the entire village you know yeah you know, the community has actually come together and created a climate emergency plan where they want to join up all the wildlife corridors and restore the land around the village but how do you actually get a hold of the landowner to be able to try and do that as a community-based project to restore that landscape. And, you know, really that com the community should have the right to buy. It should have, uh, you know, or, or government should have the right to be able to compulsory purchase land, to be able to restore it to something that's actually there for the common good. Um, so, Jyoti, yeah. sorry, thank you. I'm gonna have to um, mm -hmm. cut you off. If you wanna just wrap up, then that would be awesome. Oh, no, no, that's all, that's it for the common good. Thank you. Well, Sorry, I'm really bad at timekeeping as well. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was really, really great. Thank you so much. Um, I think maybe in the interest of time, we'll move on to um, Chris. He's going to talk about Kindling Farm, and then we'll have um, lots of time to, for questions, and you can ask um, all of the speakers all your burning questions. Chris. Thanks, Lizzie. Um, I'm just going to talk for five minutes or so on the journey we've been going through over the last five years or so to establish a farm up here in uh, around Manchester. We've been looking for a couple of years now to establish a farm and we've been wanting to do something that was um, near the city, uh, reasonably large, like 100, 120, 150 acres um, and show what we could do with um, community owned or community run assets. Um, and we've really, really struggled over the last couple of years to kind of reconcile um, a kind of politics of, you know, food justice um, with the kind of market reality of, of getting hold of land. So I'm just going to run through um, kind of the, the situation around Manchester, um, kind of southern uh, Lancashire, northern uh, Cheshire. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about the kind of options that we looked at, renting, leasing, ownership and the like. So um, the northwest uh, around Manchester, um, farms do come on um, available for rent um, one or two a year. Um, there's always small pockets of land to rent. Um, getting hold of a small couple of acre land is, is quite easy. Um, very few farms come on the market. Um, if they do come on the market, they're usually broken up. So if, if it's a farm of like 100 odd acres, it's, it's usually broken up into lots because the agents know that they can get more money if they're, they're selling off the farmhouse and farmyard um, to one buyer and, and other parcels of land to other people. Um, the market for, uh, for farms is, is really slow and it, it slowed down way before COVID. So 2018, 2019 was, um, record lowest numbers of, of farms coming on the market um, and actually the northwest as a region is one of the slowest markets for for property coming on uh, to be available for the purchase um, land prices up here farm prices farmland prices are really similar to other parts of the country they've kind of plateaued since the highs of 2014 2015 uh, but they're still pretty high 
and particularly um, around cities and urban areas because we have so much kind of development pressures, whether that's housing or land banking or, or HS2 or, or new freight terminals. Um, so um, yeah, there's a lot of hope value. If properties do come onto the market, uh, there's a lot of speculation about, well, maybe in a couple of years time, I could sell off a part of that farm and, and, and sell it for housing. And, and there's a lot of uh, large landowners around, uh, as Joseph said, large families, Church of England, MOD, uh, United Utilities own a lot of the, the land around here. But then there are also um, uh, other more progressive landowners, National Trust, Wildlife Trust own a, a lot of land here. Um, <clears throat> and when we realised that we wanted to establish a farm, we looked at lots of different options. Do we rent from a, an ethical landlord? Do we uh, own? Do we do something in the middle, like you know, take on a leasehold for 50 years or 90 years? And it became really clear to us that renting would have limited options for us, partly because very few farms come uh, available, but also what we wanted to do with the farm. So we want to establish an, an agroforestry farm. So we want to plant a lot of trees and we want to plant trees in the middle of fields. Um, we want freedom to do lots of things around the events that we hold, the training courses we, and the like. Um, and we want security of Kenya and we want security because we feel like we're building something for the future. Um, and the symbolism of it for us was really important as well. As a food justice organization, it felt that we needed to kind of hold on to the asset of the land and, and hold it for in trust for people of the future. So then we looked at ownership and there are a couple of ways that we've looked at that. So there's kind of um, buying on the open market um, or buying off market. Um, buying on the open market has a range of problems. You often need to act quickly. You need money up front. <clears throat> you're often competing with other people to purchase that farm, which often drives the prices up. And often you're competing to, to buy pockets of land um, and you're competing with people who might not necessarily be wanting to buy the land for farming and might have um, a lot of resources behind them. Um, so we felt that buying on the open market was a really tricky thing for us. We've tried it a couple of times and, and each time we've kind of looked around a farm, worked out it's, it's, you know, financially we could make it work as a farming enterprise, but just have that to walk away because we haven't had the, the finances in, up front. We've looked at um, <clears throat> buying off market and then we've also looked at other things like community asset transfers and community right to buy, or rather community right to bid. Um, and so like with some of the properties Jyoti and, and Tom have mentioned, you know, Cheshire um, Council has owned a lot of uh, county farms in, the, in their time. And we've looked at whether we could secure one of those either as an asset transfer through uh, UK uh, legislation or whether we could, um, find a property that we could uh, have registered as a community asset and then have a right to bid for it if it ever came on the on the open market. But these again have been really kind of, um, the timing hasn't been right for us, right properties haven't been there and then there hasn't been the political will within local authorities to kind of take that forward with us. So where we've ended up is um, we've been spending the last year or so looking for a property off market. So an individual or a family who's looking at selling and um, we approach them before they go to market. Um, and we've done that a couple of ways. Um, we've looked at raising our profile in the local farming community, asking um, farmers that we work with to ask neighbors and to ask around. And also in the past, we've uh, engaged land agents. So um, we've engaged both Savills, a really large um, land agent, um, and then local land agents as well. But actually what's ended up happening is whilst doing all of these things and exploring all these options, um, uh, we were lucky enough in late 2019 to be approached by an individual who was really keen on what Kindling did and was really interested in us uh, buying a farm from them. So um, <clears throat> where we're at the moment is uh, we're looking to buy a farm um, and I won't talk much more about that, but what I will talk about is um, how we're doing this. So for us, it was really important that we um, set up a community benefit society so that we purchased the farm with a whole range of other people. Um, we're gonna do this with uh, community shares. So we've got a community share offer running at the moment. And this is important for two things for us. 
we obviously are able to raise funds so people are able to invest in the kindling farm and um, that means that we get a smaller mortgage but also we end up with lots and lots of supportive members who get involved in the farm and make the whole kind of experience more communal collective and more resilient the other reason for doing this as a community benefit society is that we um, lock the asset so if we purchase this farm it's locked forever as a community asset so we couldn't sell it on and if uh, things went badly and we had to sell up for some financial reason um, there wouldn't ever be any um, there's no shared profits with the shareholders so um, if we did have to sell the farm for whatever reason, um, any money raised would be um, would have to go to a similar project, a similar farm nearby. Um, and then the other really good thing about uh, running this as a community shares offer is the shares that we issue um, don't reflect the value of the land. So as Tom was saying earlier, we're kind of taking the land and the value of the land out. We're taking the land out of the market and we're removing um, any speculative or hope value that that property might have in, in the future. So we're kind of setting up a community benefit society with lots of uh, community investors to secure a property, hold it for um, forever, and also remove it from um, the market. So that's kind of the approach we're taking. The property we're hoping to buy is possibly around um, you know, over uh, well over a million pounds. Um, we're looking at raising half the money through community shares. Um, we've been running our share offer for three, just over three weeks now. Um, we've already, it's been amazing. We've had over 250 investors and we've raised uh, just over 600,000 um, pounds, which is like, yeah, we, we feel very um, honored that people really wanna kind of join us in, in purchasing this farm. And when we do talk to people about why they're investing, a lot of it is down to kind of all the problems and all the challenges they see in the food and farming system. So we kind of hope that um, that this will inspire other people to do this. We clearly have some real problems and we have to have a lot of uh, ambition and we need to kind of look more broadly at kind of the solutions that we need. And we obviously need government kind of movement on these things but we were asked uh, the other day by some investors kind of why we've gone down this approach and for us it was like well we're really hoping that we can establish this farm making a success of it and inspire other people to go off and do exactly the same thing and I think well, I might stop there Lizzie. Oh thank you thank you to all our speakers that's so been so interesting and like really yeah gone into so much depth about um all the different aspects of la land access and how it relates to the wider food sovereignty movement um so we've got 22 minutes for questions does anybody have any questions and also if if you don't want to turn your camera on that's fine you can you can ask them in the chat and i'll pick them up um there are a couple in there already but if anyone has any Feel free to put your hand up. Okay, we'll go to the chat um, for now and it might inspire you to, um, to yeah, to ask more. Um, so this maybe is a question for all of you um, and you can pick between, um, between yourselves who wants to answer it first. Um, how would an agroecological society with lots of people employed in its creation affect food prices? And how would we allow the poorest in our society to participate in buying such foods, which currently are so much more expensive. I don't know who wants to answer that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I can talk about it a bit because it's something we've been trying to look at within Landworkers Alliance. Um, but quickly before I did that, I just wanted to sort of back up what, what um, Chris was saying in that, um, yeah, now through the Land Workers Alliance, I, I participate a lot in government panels at, that look at both, um, you know, our environmental management and, and our food system in, in lots of ways. And um, it's a slow, it's a very slow thing 
to change policy. <laughs> and um, you're yeah, absolutely, you know, firsthand, you know, I can see it developing before me. Um, it, you know, you, the communities have to get on and do this. You know, we cannot wait for government to act. Um, but there is something that, you know, that um, I, I'd like to ask Kindling about it, which is that, you know, now I'm on this panel, it's called the ELMS Advisory Panel, which is developing the new subsidy scheme for what happens with farming. And one element of what government's putting forward, which will be really interesting, is to try and bring forward community solutions to, um, you know, to land usage, to look at how we can get more environmental land management on a community level. Um, and, and the pilot that they're wanting to do that um, with and try and think about how we get a community involved in land use and to looking at um, you know more environmental land management and food production is around the Manchester area. So <laughs> I'm really hoping I can send them to Kindling Trust um, and to, to observe and find out about what you're doing um, and to see this and actually be inspired to do more because they're planning to try and help invest in land to be able to do this for communities. And I think they'd be really inspired by that example. So, you know, communities taking this sort of thing forward and then using it as a case study to then leverage wider change so we can inspire things is just the absolute heart of what I think we need to do to like, you know, revolutionize this land use system. Um, and you guys are absolutely at the front line of it. <laughs> so it's just amazing, amazing thing. But um, on, the, on the food side of things, um, I, I think I wanted to point out that not only land should be treated as a commons, but also food. And that as a society, we're, mar you know, we're privatizing absolutely everything. And the reason it's called an environmental land management system that government's putting into place is because our government is so neoliberal that they're going by the, you know, the absolute, um, you know, <laughs> you know, philosophy that anything that's tradable is a commodity and they're seeing food as a commodity and, and environmental land management is something that's there for the wider good. But actually, food is a common good as well and basic food security for everybody so that everybody has access to affordable healthy nutritious locally produced food should be everybody's basic human right and government shouldn't just be leaving that 100 percent to the market because if you leave it to the market people that are producing food well that's healthy and nutritious and organic you know and and produced with some care and craft and love um is more expensive because it's been left to the market to become a niche thing that's only available for the rich. If government intervenes and makes that more of the norm, then those people are not always going to be competing against cheap supermarket chains from, you know, workers that are exploited in, in South of Spain. So things can be shipped here cheaply and then puts, you know, the other the horticultural businesses under pressure. All of that stuff needs to be dealt with. There needs to be policy on a government level that actually makes good, affordable, healthy food, everybody's basic human right, and to acknowledge that in many ways. And it's not just paying for food so that it's cheaper. You know, the policies that need to go into a place to make this the scenario that happens are all sorts of things. It means regulating the people that are doing really shit things. It needs to be, you know, putting tariffs on stuff, make, make you know, make sure that everybody's getting a living wage you know it's a huge complex set of problems but that right to food and the food that you know the fact that food shouldn't be left to the market is actually something that needs to be recognized and it and um it's something in the land workers alliance where we're trying to push for right to food legislation that means that you know we actually think about the complex set of things that needs to be done so that healthy affordable organic food is available to everybody brilliant um Tom, I see you're jumping, Thanks. and then maybe we can um, get an answer from Chris from Jody's question. Sure, I, th I just on the you know on the question of um, you know affordability. I think like um, you know, irrespective of whether or not we are in an agroecological sort of food system, this is very much a labour market question, and a lot of this work really go uh, a lot of the work here is around you know, Jyoti, you touched on it on sort of minimum wage, but I think it's very much around, um, I guess, wage differentials and ensuring that, um, you know, the, that the pe people who work at the lowest end of the spectrum aren't, um, uh, aren't underpaid compared to those who earn lots. Um, uh, the, the way that, you know, the economy works is around the sort of cycles and flows of money. And if you think about the sort of holdings of money or the holdings of centers of money, the wealthiest people um, hold the most amount of money to the prevention of other people actually getting access to it. And 
really the, the, you know like i say agroecology probably isn't the answer in this case the the real the real answer is around reform of the labor market so ensuring that you know minimum wages increase significantly and the maximum wages that we have at the moment um ideally reduce we know that's not going to happen but certainly say stagnant whilst other, other people rise up so i think that would be my answer to the question you know um that sort of more marxist one of uh a robin hood one of robbing from the rich and giving to the poor I guess, I guess the only thing I would add is, um, you know, that for us, we kind of see poverty. We don't see food poverty. We, feed, we see food insecurity. Um, you know, we're a food insecure country and that rain, you know, that that's built on a whole range of things about confidence in cooking to, you know, financial insecurities and stuff. But um, the problem with this discourse about food poverty is that, you um, you know, the answer then is to drive the prices lower, you know, but we have a food industry and a farming system that kind of creates a lot of that poverty. So it's kind of, it's really complex. The only ways that we've been able to kind of um, square this circle as, as an organization is uh, we've got a site in uh, Stockport Woodbank Community Food Hub, and we have uh, commercial growers, farm starters, uh, new entrants into farming working alongside community gardeners um, and we run a social prescribing program there. And the only way we've able to kind of, on the one hand, pay growers well, and on the other hand, um, make food kind of access, good food accessible to people is through public support. So the public sector paying for that through social prescribing or commissioning and stuff until, until we have a, you know, a government solution, we, we can't do it. Yeah, exactly. We have a, um, a project called the Community Resilience Project at the moment, um, where 36 different farms um, in the Land Workers Alliance are working on various solutions to try and address food insecurity and get food to, um, to, to people who need food at an affordable price. And some of that's through solidarity box models, some through getting people involved. Um, you know, a lot of times it's just by shortening that supply chain so that people are getting things direct um, rather than um, you know, middlemen taking bits, you know, there's all sorts of different ways and in, in, in a contextual way, lots of different places are trying to come up with solutions to being able to make that more possible. So we've got a question from Alison. Hi, uh, sorry, a little bit dark in here. Um, <laughs> thanks everyone for, for your talks. So interesting, so inspiring and so kind of overwhelming I think is the other thing to say about it I think you've all alluded to kind of how complex the issue is and the fact that um, there's kind of a lot of things that seem to be holding us back from doing a lot of these things um, and I think quite a few of you have just said about how uh, kind of government policy change is probably the way that things could happen wholesale um, but I suppose when you think about one of the comments I was just going to make was there's so many benefits to this. I mean, there's benefits to the fact that you've got the food security um, and there's benefits to the health from people getting the like local food, working on the land, you know, being using their bodies a bit more by being a bit more manual in that sense. Um, and I think from the community side, there's like a really social part to this as well. I, I guess my question is, do you think this needs to come from the bottom up? Is that the way this is going to work? That you've got to kind of show it working in lots of different places? Or is it only going to happen with kind of taking away that, um, that sense of ownership that the very few have? I, I suppose is it something that just needs to be tackled from both sides? I don't know what your kind of thoughts are on that, I suppose. It's just, it seems like such a complex thing. It's like, where do you start with it? Yeah, it's, yeah. <clears throat> I, mean, I mean, we take inspiration from Scotland. We we find it really frustrating. Like, we, we're not close to Scotland, but we're closer to Scotland than, than some. And, you know, it feels like um, politically we're closer to Scotland than we are to London. Um, there's some really inspiring things happening in in Scotland and, and it is a very top-down approach but I think because of the scale of it 
you know, that there are much more, the politicians are much more in touch with kind of activists and, and practitioners and stuff, and that's reflected. So I, I kind of do, I do feel overwhelmed, but I do feel really inspired by what's happening in Scotland. Um, that's a really great question, Alison. Thank you. Um, um, I think um, so. You know, there's a question of, I guess, there's a question of policy and does policy work on a sort of system change level? And you know, with the greatest respect to Jyoti Neal, the WA, and, and all policy sort of advocates waiting for that change is unbelievably slow. And I guess, from my perspective, I, I do think that pragmatic and practical approaches seem to have seem to be more effective than waiting for that policy change to happen. Um, um, having said that, you know, I, I, I do know that there can be a, um, uh, I don't know that it can be difficult to sort of not necessarily energize yourself, but it can be difficult to sort of give yourself permission to go ahead and then do the things that you want to do. But I'll tell you a quick anecdote here. Like I, a few um, years ago, I was getting into sort of, you know, open water swimming and I was asking like a mate of mine, uh, do I need to sort of, um, ask permission from somebody to go and swim in the Thames, which, you know, the Oxford end, not the London end, which would be horrible. But um, uh, the, and the thing he said to me was like, "Hey, if you don't ask permission, you can do whatever the hell you like," <laughs> which I thought was quite quite good. And not that I'm encouraging that, but I, I guess the the, the sort of um, point of the story is that like there are policy mechanisms that we have in the UK that we can use. You know, you look at the Localism Act. The Localism Act, to be honest, is a lot of it is pretty shit. Um, it's not it's not great, but like the um, uh, we all do have permission to go ahead and do these sort of great things. So, you know, Kindling has permission to go ahead and do some good things on the land in Greater Manchester. Um, we've all got permission to go ahead and set up our own businesses, enterprise projects, whatever, that can transform the land in in, uh, in the ways that we want it to. So, uh, yeah, to sort of sum that up and to hopefully answer it, Alison, I'd say, yeah, the, the practical approaches from our perspective seem to work better, but the policy changes can sort of, um, I guess, be tools to... Um, enable that to stick longer term. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As a person that works on policy, I think it's a double process. You know, I mean, I focus my energy on it because I can handle <laughs> dealing with un unlimited amounts of frustration. <laughs> but uh, it, yeah, I mean, it's a slow way. But the thing is, those pioneers and the people that are taking it, you know, and doing it in a very unhelpful context are the ones that are going to lead the way and create that social momentum you know you can't get policy change unless you have wider social change and that social change needs to you know there needs to be enough um, awareness there needs to be people that feel like this is the right thing that we should be doing and moving towards to be able to try and then leverage that policy change but when you do get that policy change then sometimes you can get really tremendous things happening on a quite a large scale but it just takes a quiet while and then you know unless you've got those pioneers and those people on the grassroots from the bottom up really pushing these examples forward to get enough people switched on to something that can then push something that you know actually knocks away some of that power that tremendous power because you know it will actually it can also depoliticize people thinking the only way we can do this is without relying on government and that steadily gives more and more and more and power to those massive corporations and the you know and, and the and the Tory politicians and you know all the WTO and you know all those things and we do see a consolidation of the food sector we do see a consolidation of land and the the really terrible idea that so many people are being paid for land ownership etc but we, you know we broke that up actually the agriculture bill was passed and you can really see, you know, the reason, you know, the some of these big industrial dairy farms are going down is they've lost their subsidy for doing what they're doing, you know. So a policy change like that can have a real shakeup to actually release, you know, a load of stuff that is breaking up the system. And we've just got to get in there and make sure the pieces fall into place in a helpful way, whether the, rather than a way that, you know, furthers more consolidation of land and more corporate control and more power. But, you know, we've got to think of ways to break that up on a big level as well. So I think it's kind of both both working together and realize that actually what we're doing, every choice you make in life is political, you know, and it's it, and it's moving something forward. Towards what we want to be. Thank you. That's great. Awesome.
Any more questions? Probably got time for one more. Yeah, Nina. Hiya. Um, thank you, everybody, for everything you've said. Um, I recently discovered, and I'm quite late to the party in, in this way, um, I recently read a little bit about um, vertical farming. And um, my partner uh, is currently studying um, permaculture. And um, those two things, those two buzzwords are hovering around my world at the moment. And I am learning, which is why I'm here. Um, there's something about what, you, what all of you have said this evening and vertical farming that doesn't sit right with me. So, for instance, um, a lot of the statistics that you've given have, uh, in order for us to become, to, to have sovereignty over our food, um, the changes that you mentioned earlier, Jyoti, about um, reducing meat, reducing sugar, um, planting trees and creating distribution zones. I see that as a real solution. Um, and I guess what I'm sort of trying to say, and, and, and I'm not, I don't know a lot about it. When I say I've read about it, 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 I don't have a vast amount of information about this, but I don't know whether vertical farming is a solution or is it a, I want to call it a cop-out. I, I, and I don't mean that rudely because I don't have enough information about it, but is vertical farming just putting a plaster on something on a on a, on a huge wound um you know that that is you know essentially going to just create this chasm and and, and just yeah it's just going to get worse and worse and I, I just wanted to know your opinion on that um and whether that's you know a, along with um yeah along with the work that people are trying to put in I, I, sorry I, it's, a, it's a long question but what I read about was during lockdown, I read about um, a company called Let Us Grow in Bristol who um, did some incredible things for the community, um, uh, feeding the community. But again, I feel like it was almost a like a farming food bank at the time. And does it have longevity? That's what I'm asking. There we go. Does it have longevity? Yeah, I just popped in the chat that like, um, you know, uh, you know, because we're doing this land use modeling and one of the reasons they say vertical farms are great is that it might like spare land so that we can plant more of the trees that need to be planted. Um, and really that's actually like corporate spin in lots of ways because, you know, there's a really like, um, really competitive research and development budget. And I know because we've been trying to apply for funds for it through the Land Workers Alliance to do loads of research on agroecology. And we can hardly get a look in for all the vertical farming companies and gene editing companies trying to compete for funds. So they're really good at spin. You know, and and they say, well, OK, well, we can go up, you know, it's going to save loads of land so that we can spare land for nature and plant all these trees that we need to mitigate the climate crisis. And they put it forward as a solution. Same with gene editing. They say it's going to spare loads of land so that we can mitigate the climate crisis. And they call it all carbon friendly farming. Right. That is corporate spin, really. And it, it is really swallowing up a research budget that should be there or budgets just for agriculture in general, for people to be able to get access to land and all these other kinds of things. Yeah, because it's actually millions and millions of pounds going into research and development of this sort of thing. And, uh, you know, what can be grown in a vertical farm is, um, you know, greens, mostly lettuces, spinach, you know, and some other vegetables. And, uh, and when you look at overall land take for the diets that we need to be able to feed ourselves, vegetables take up a tiny fraction of the space. Vegetables are you know, really productive on a very small area of land. They actually provide a high degree of employment um, you know, when it's on actual land. Um, but it, and if you put it in a vertical farm, you know, you're using all that steel, all that electricity, all that water, everything to produce something that's only gonna save 0.016% of land usage. You know, it's it's the you know it's it's the extensive like production of arable grains for animal feeds and that kind of thing that's actually taking up the land, and you can't produce that in a vertical farm. So I um, might come. Oh, sorry, Chris, if you want to go and go. Got nothing to say. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Um, yeah, thanks, Nina. Um, I yeah I agree with you. I I I'm not a fan of vertical farms um, for several of the reasons Jyoti said. I think um, uh, 
one you know one of the issues with them and I, i've come across letters grow i mean chris hasn't mentioned this but i used to work for fx which is the platform that the share issues is on and they they approached fx i was did a lot of investigating into let us grow's financial model which is very similar to a lot of other vertical farms and at the core of it is actually a very capitalistic model where you're um finding that the people involved are looking to eventually sell that company on for you know private massive financial gain and that doesn't sit nice with me um you know the the complete opposite with kindling farm where you know the investment can go into creating some good stuff um uh what else I was going to say on this? Oh, yeah, the other thing, you know, the, 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 one of the, you know, boring system science diagrams that I showed earlier, um, you know, the, the two sort of pathways that you were looking at at the end of that food wars one, you know, the top one is that sort of like um, that tech approach. Yeah. Um, and the bottom one is the sort of permaculture approach that your your partner is, is sort of, uh, you know, working on. Um, I, I I much prefer that sort of life sciences um style of doing things and i think that is a way forward whether or not that's going to happen I, I really don't know i suspect it's probably going to be the other one um mostly because you know of the i guess the intense marketing that you see around tech solutions and you know my final sort of anecdote on this is that like i was having a chat with somebody the other day who was really taken in by this stuff and they were like oh i just seen this sort of drone that um they're, they're doing to sort of you know spread seeds across um you know the amazon jungle to replant seeds and my response is that well you know why are they having to invent a drone when just a bird pooping could have done that anyway <laughs> you know it's it's completely bonkers um so you know um yeah uh yeah and sorry i'm not a, i'm not a fan I'm, I'm a bit uneasy about them particularly when they're they're making you know they could make large uh you know private wealth to a few number of people thank you very much it, it you kind of con confirmed my suspicions both of you thank you brilliant um chris i don't know if you have anything to add on that. no cool um well we are at time um and yeah it's been really amazing um to hear from all the speakers and also to have some really good questions. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for coming and thank you to our speakers again. Um, and yeah, I will send out a follow-up email with the recording tomorrow. So we've got all your email addresses um, from the Eventbrite registration um, and you can share the recording with any friends and family who missed this as well. But yeah, I think that's, that's everything. Um, thank you all for coming. Viva Kindling Farm. <laughs> You're the pioneers. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I'll be making an investment this evening. So uh, do take a look at the investment perspective of everybody. It's great. <laughs> and you fed my daughter for so many years in Manchester Uni. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. You should come and visit. <laughs> yeah, will do. Cool. Thanks, Lizzie. That was great. Yeah, thank you, Lizzie. Cheers. Oh, thank you all. I'll stop the recording now. <laughs> yes. Brilliant. Tom, where are you now?